Good evening. My name is Mark Barnico, and I'm the Executive Director of the University of Chicago Francis and Rose Yuen Campus in Hong Kong. Thank you for joining our Pop Asia series program entitled Evolution and Influence of Rap Music in Taiwan. We're sharing tonight's event live via Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube from the UChicago Yuen Campus in Hong Kong. If audience members have questions to submit, you can do so through the questions and answer button by first registering on Zoom. I also encourage you to visit the UN campus website at www.uchicago.hk and subscribe to our e-news for the latest UN campus programs and information. Or you can also follow the UChicago UN campus Hong Kong social media accounts on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Tonight, Professor Philip Bowman of the University of Chicago Music Department will host Professor Meredith Schweig of Emory University and author of the book, Renegade Rhymes, and Professor and Chair of the Music Department at CUHK, uh, Professor Frederick Lau. And they'll discuss how Taiwan musicians use rap music as a creative outlet to explore, reconcile, and preserve their identity and history. Let's start with a brief introduction of our host and moderator tonight. Professor Philip Bowman is the Ludwig Rosenberger Distinguished Service Professor in Jewish History, Music, and the Humanities in the College. He's also the Associate Faculty of the Divinity School at the University of Chicago. He was the first ethnomusicologist at the University of Chicago. Professor Bowman's teaching and research draw upon diverse methods and perspectives in music scholarship to forge an ethnomusicology built on foundations in ethnography, history, and performance. He's particularly interested in exploring the interstices between music and religion, music, race, and colonial encounters, and music and nationalism. Professor Bowman is the author or editor of many books in English and German with translations into numerous languages. The first edition of Music, Nationalism, and the Making of the New Europe received the Derek Allen Prize for Musicology from the British Academy. The Cambridge History of World Music received the 2015 Bruno Nettle Prize from the Society of Ethnomusicology. And his co-edited volume, Jazz Worlds, World Jazz, received the Roth Soli Award from the American Musicological Society. Welcome back, Professor Bowman. We look forward to hearing about this really interesting subject tonight. And perhaps you could start us off by introducing us to your guests this evening. Thank you, Mark. It's, uh, it's such a pleasure again to join you and to, to join a webinar, this, this wonderful series that the, the University of Chicago Hong Kong campus has been sponsoring. Um, we feel very fortunate to have your support um, as we build programs in publishing in East Asian music, uh, also at the University of Chicago Press. And, and, and I want to, to, to extend uh, gratitude also from the University of Chicago Press. We're very, very fortunate this evening to um, have with us Meredith Schweig, who is the author of uh, the, the book that will, she will present and that we will discuss this evening, uh, Renegade Rhymes. Um, Meredith is um, a, a scholar who has been uh, contributing in many, many ways to, um, the, to our understanding of music narrative, popular music, um, and the, the, the modernity, really, uh, especially of, of uh, Taiwanese music, but also of East Asian and Chinese music more broadly. Uh, Meredith did her, uh, her uh, graduate and undergraduate work at Harvard University, taking her PhD at Harvard. Um, and since 2015, she has served as assistant professor of ethnomusicology at Emory University. Um, her research on Teresa Tang um, has now begun to appear for several years and is the foundation for uh, an, another book that's on, on the way, uh, tentatively titled um, Enter the Butterfly, Voicing Teresa Tang in Post-Cold War Taiwan. Um, her work uh, is has has inspired many of us to think about language 
and music and narrative. Um, and it has also attracted many and important um, uh, prizes from, uh, the, from her colleagues in East Asian Studies and Ethnomusicology. Uh, we're very, very fortunate uh, this evening also to be joined by Frederick Lau, um, uh, an old friend from my own um, uh, graduate years at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where he also took his, his doctorate. Uh, Fred returns to, uh, to Hong Kong, uh, to the Chinese University of Hong Kong, um, where he did his undergraduate work um and he but he now holds the position of chair also of music um and of the music department and the director of the center for chinese music studies um he's he's published widely um uh, not only uh, on topics re uh, related to chinese music uh, popular music political music, music and politics, but particularly he's contributed to ongoing dialogues about the encounter between um, musics in East Asia and Western musics of various kinds. Um, um, I might uh, point out that um, for those of you who want to, to, to have a general um, introduction to, to Fred's work, um, particularly also a foundational work on the music of China. Um, you might turn to his 2008 Oxford University Press book, Music in China, Experiencing Music, uh, Experiencing Music, Experiencing, Expressing Culture. Um, it's great to have Fred join us in this discussion. Um, and, 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 and share with us um, um, his experiences. But at this uh, point, it's important for us now to turn to the star of the evening, as we've been calling her uh, for a while now, uh, Meredith Schweig, um, who will present to us from her book, um, Renegade Rhymes. Meredith, welcome from Atlanta. Thank you so much for that gracious introduction. Um, I, I'm, I'm really honored to be here. Um, I want to begin by expressing my gratitude to the organizers uh, and hosts of tonight's event, the University of Chicago UN campus in Hong Kong, particularly Mark Barnico uh, and Angela Siu, who's been heroic uh, in terms of bringing the, the technical aspects of this together. Um, and of course, I'd like to share my wholehearted thanks to Professors Phil Bowman and Fred Lau um, for serving as such gracious and thoughtful partners in conversation. Um, I also would like to acknowledge the musicians whose sounds and stories are at the center of Renegade Rhymes. Um, some are, I believe, here in the virtual audience tonight. Um, and I extend um, truly a most heartfelt greeting to them. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my slideshow. Just a moment. All right. So in, in recognition of the fact that some readers will approach Renegade Rhymes with maybe some knowledge uh, about global hip hop, some will approach it with maybe some knowledge about Taiwan, and some will approach it with maybe neither. Um, I'd like to commence by providing some broader context for the project. Um, Renegade Rhymes invites readers into Taiwan's vibrant hip hop scene to explore the social, cultural, and political dynamics of life in a post authoritarian democracy. The dawn of hip hop in Taiwan coincided precisely with the twilight of nearly four decades of martial law, um, and that was a period from 1949 to 1987 under the KMT, also known as the Kuomintang, or the Chinese Nationalist Party. <clears throat> the government of Chiang Kai-shek curbed, curbed the expressive autonomy of individuals and communities on the island to quell pro-communist and pro-independence activities and to bolster support for nationalist claims to political legitimacy. Beginning in the 1960s, non-Mandarin cultural production and the public use of non-Mandarin languages were vigorously suppressed. Political liberalization in the late 1980s and early 1990s afforded youth audiences on the island unprecedented access to global media commodities, um, particularly after the, the official end of the government monopoly on mass media in 1993. 
Um, radio, film, and television at this point supported hip hop's pre-internet expansion. Of course, after the internet, everything shifts. Um, as rap songs and music videos filtered into the current of mainstream popular music flowing from the United States, where hip hop was forged by black and Latinx youth in the South Bronx borough of New York City um, out to East Asia. Beginning in the immediate post martial law period, the book follows Taiwan's budding rappers as they critique the island's political system, spin tales from their perspectives as members of marginalized ethnic communities in some cases, and reimagine previously suppressed local musical forms. A series of ethnographic and historical chapters trace an arc between these earliest activities and the innovations of present day musicians who grapple with continued existential uncertainty imposed by the island's ambiguous geopolitical status and accelerating neoliberalization. So I wanna share some excerpts from the book tonight, um, primarily from, um, from, oh, here's the, this is the cover image, <laughs> from the prologue, uh, which is called First the Rain. Um, and I hope that this will provide you with a sense not only of some of the major themes of Renegade Rhymes, but also of how I commenced my 12 year long engagement with the Taiwan rap scene and initially encountered some of the artists who became uh, the heart of this ethnography, excuse me. Um, I'll intersperse some sounds and images here. Uh, and this seems like a great time to take advantage of the multimedia capabilities of Zoom. Um, so I'm gonna share a couple of videos from, from my field work. Um, the prologue opens with a rich description of a 2009 benefit concert, which was staged uh, in the wake of Typhoon Morakot, the deadliest storm to strike Taiwan in recorded history. Um, staged in an open lot in the middle of Tainan City, which is in the south of the island, the production raised money on behalf of Typhoon victims, um, a disproportionate number of whom were members of the Taiwan indigenous community from the remote village of Shaolin. Um, the text that I'm sharing will be sort of lightly edited for clarity and in deference to the limits on our time this evening. I knew where I wanted to start and where I wanted to end, and in the middle I had to make some, some choices. So with that, I'll begin. In the aftermath of Morakot, the island seems alternately numb with grief and apoplectic with rage. Hoping to channel righteous anger into productive action, Prominent Southern Taiwanese rapper Dua Gi sets about organizing the 921.87 Rap Benefit Concert in his home city of Tainan. The event's name kindles memories of past trauma. 87 or August 7th refers to the day that Morakot made landfall in Taiwan. 921 alludes to a massive earthquake that struck the island on September 21st, 1999, killing 2,500 and leaving 100,000 homeless. The reference serves as a potent reminder to those who attend, not only of previous natural disasters, but also of previous controversies surrounding the government's response to the crises. Critiques leveled at public officials following Morakot bear striking resemblances to those that followed 921, as victims accuse authorities of lacking the skills and resources necessary to mount successful search and rescue missions. In a conversation we have the following year, Dwaki explains to me that his primary goal in organizing the concert was simply to encourage people to remember the storm. Moreover, by linking Morakot to the 921 earthquake, he hoped to underscore for an easily distracted public that, quote, these things must not be forgotten. Next time, when it happens again, we can't forget what came before, end quote. I traveled to Tainan, 56 miles west of Shaolin, to attend the all-day event. I hear the concert before I see it and follow the booming loudspeakers down an alleyway into an open lot where a crowd of several hundred people has gathered shoulder to shoulder. <clears throat> Even from some distance away, my sternum pounds so hard that it seems like the force of the sound alone could move my blood. On the graffitied walls around us, old political advertisements wilt and peel away in the humidity. Customers exit the convenience store nearby, clutching cold drinks, and open front eateries serve curry rice, dumplings, and bubble tea, alongside auto parts retailers and clothing shops. At temporary kiosks, vendors hawk CDs, handicrafts, and vinyl toys in the likeness of Taiwanese folk heroes and earth gods. It surprises me that no one living or working here complains about the noise, which is substantial. 
And the show isn't merely loud. It is a riot of chaotic timbres and textures, distinct from the urban white noise that permeates Taiwan cities, arresting and designed to draw rather than disperse attention. The lot resounds with an irregular, sometimes halting mix of speech and song. Mandarin, holo, haka, and English languages, floor thumping and fist bumping low end beats and samples from stylistically varied recordings from Hakka folk songs to Marvin Gaye to Black Street to Yao Su Rong. The atmosphere is simultaneously somber and high spirited. Nearly 50 artists and groups take the stage over the course of the day, performing for 10 or 20 minutes at a time. Some present upbeat, danceable fare with joyful lyrics about partying and romance in the hopes of cheering the crowd. Others play more solemn songs addressing Taiwan's political status, environmental degradation, and the systematic erosion of local languages and lifeways. It is difficult to tell where music ends and linguistic signification begins. When uttered aloud, lyrics have contours defined by the four tones of Mandarin, the six or seven tones of Hakka, and the seven tones of Holo. On one level, I can perceive how the pitched pronunciation of tonal language might contribute to the musical interest of a rap performance. Beyond their aesthetic qualities, however, these contours are themselves constitutive of meaning. Making meaning of and through sound and text is the distinct objective of events such as this one. Acts of remembrance endow victims and witnesses alike with the power to interpret and make sense of trauma, intervene momentarily in the production of historical narrative, and determine whether what has happened constitutes convergence with or divergence from what has come before. The 921.87 Rap Benefit Concert provides an opportunity for rap artists and fans to engage in such remembrance, reflect on current hardships, and contemplate their relationships to prior catastrophes. In speech and song, performers make deliberate attempts throughout the day to embed Morakot, not just in a history of natural disaster in Taiwan, but also in broader socio-political narratives characterized by intense, often combative relationships with authorities. The impulse to weave the typhoon into a larger musical narrative of discontent seems a strategic and ultimately affirming one. In the potent moments after rupture, artists call attention to an array of possible futures, some anarchic, some conciliatory, moving forward. Taipei-based quintet Kao Cho Ching takes the stage after nightfall to present their 2007 track, Civil Revolt Part 1. Backed by DJ J. Chen, the group's two lead MCs, Fan Jiang and Fish Lin, enter from opposite sides of the stage and ask the audience to raise their hands, imploring them in both Mandarin and English, quote, fight for your rights, end quote. The song's multilingual lyrics argue that, the, that, quote, the government pushed the people into chaos, giving rise to a time of unrest, end quote, following the Qing Dynasty's annexation of Taiwan during the late 17th century. It begins with the blaring of a siren and the hypnotic repetition of the recorded holo phrase, civil revolt, civil revolt, chanted by a female vocalist who traces a pentatonic melodic figure reminiscent of the characteristic opening and closing measures of the river and lake tune frequently performed in the context of Taiwanese opera. Taken together, the sounds of the siren <clears throat> and the repeated urging toward rebellion create a sense of imminent emergency, while the citation of local opera roots the crisis firmly in Taiwanese soil. And I'm gonna play a, a brief clip here. <laughs> Apologies for the, for the quality of the video. Um, this is both an old video and also from very early in my field work during my graduate studies um, when, when I did not have a great camera. <laughs> but um, I think we'll give you a sense of the energy of this, of this moment.
The lyrics to Civil Revolt Part One do not address natural disaster, but disaster that is human made, specifically the interethnic feuds among indigenous Holo and Hakka communities that roiled Taiwan throughout the period of Qing rule, which the central government sought alternately to curb and to exploit. Kao Choqing invites listeners to reflect on how the fractured 21st century political landscape of Taiwan might be an extension of these events, which took place hundreds of years ago. By performing the song in the context of, a, of the Morakot benefit, they recast a story about Qing mismanagement as an allegory for the failure of the ruling KMT to protect its citizens from harm following the storm. Jenny Edkins has written that, quote, what we call trauma takes place when the very powers that we are convinced will protect us and give us security become our tormentors, end quote. Kao Cho Ching's performance at the 921.87 Rap Benefit concert suggests that Taiwan's past and present tribulations are the result of repeated iterations of the same betrayal. And yet, Civil Revolt Part 1 also envisages a future, one in which Taiwan's peoples, regardless of their ethnic, linguistic, or political affiliations, practice self-determination and seize control of a collective destiny. Excuse me, I lost my text for a moment. Excuse me. Tainan-based Brotherhood gestures more directly to Morakot with their song Love, L-U-V, written in 2008 to protest environmental degradation. In the context of the benefit, the song's lyrics highlight human responsibility for the mudslides that regularly strike rural parts of the island and attain new levels of deadliness with Morakot. Theirs is a slow, contemplative piece, one that does not corral the furious energy of Civil Revolt Part One, but instead paints a series of grim pictures, of skies growing dark, of people moving slowly off the streets, and finally, of a massive mudslide washing away the dreams of children playing in the rain. I'm going to play a clip from this as well. <laughs> The sound of lead MC Dadi's voice is soft and mellow as he utters, barely above a whisper, wishes for a better tomorrow. Quote, Taiwan has suffered, you and I know, but with just a little bit of love, our motherland will heal, end quote. And yet Brotherhood also suggests that love, when rendered in the form of aid, is a limited, limited resource in a part of the world so frequently afflicted by natural disaster. At the end of the second verse, Dadi raps, quote, I will not send my love out to Sichuan, but will give my what will keep my love in Taiwan, end quote. His words reflect a critical view of financial support the Taiwan government and individual Taiwan-based donors sent to the People's Republic of China following the Sichuan earthquake of 2008. In a performance scarcely four minutes long, several concentric narratives ripple out all at once. The central story of love, about a mudslide caused by soil erosion from irresponsible land development, the story of Morakot, and perhaps more specifically of Shaolin, summoned by the song's reference to a deluge, and a larger story questioning the government's responses to natural disasters, including those that affect the PRC, with which Taiwan has a fraught relationship. Towards the event's conclusion, rapper and Tainan native RPG, who's acting as master of ceremonies, welcomes Duaqi to the stage, and the two engage in some patter. Duagi is a celebrity here in Tainan and also an active, affable member of the community. Earlier, he and many of today's performers lit incense and made offerings of pineapples, papayas, and ghost money to the local gods. He announces the debut of a new song written expressly for the 921.87 Rap Benefit concert with local R&B singer and producer Jay Wu, which they call Unforgettable Pain. Although I know him primarily as a performer of holo hip hop, Duagi's desire for communicative expediency here favors the use of Mandarin, Taiwan's official national language since the KMT's arrival in 1945. 
The rapper's voice is hoarse as he delivers his bars in the verse, but Jay Wu leans into smooth soulfulness on a sung chorus in which he vows to soothe victims. Um, I'm going to play a clip of this song. This is um, not from my field recording, but this is from the single version of this that, um, that they released. Um, and you'll see the lyrics here as well. Although it begins with a description of the storm's violence, the chorus swiftly shifts focus to the ways in which Morakot has brought out the best in people especially those who have volunteered to help out in hard hit areas. Accompaniment to Dwagi and Jay Wu's voices is sparse, a simple drum kick and short piano riff consisting of a descending five note figure. This is layered on top of a chopped up and repeated sample of a vocalist performing a non-specific Austronesian melody, a sonic mnemonic that reminds listeners that many of those affected hail from indigenous communities. The intermingling sentiments of hope and loss, poetry and pain, link the song to so many others performed throughout the day. It feels like a summation. As Dwagi wraps his set, I head for an exit and pass a dozen young men painstakingly lighting hundreds of tea lights on the pavement, arranged in the shape of Taiwan. Several weeks after Morakot, the weather is still erratic and gusts of wind blow out the candles again and again. But the candlelighters persist in rekindling each extinguished flame, such that the borders of the island constantly re recede and reappear, always vulnerable, but ultimately intact. Having brought you a little bit into the rap world, as I first encountered it in 2009, I want to zoom back out now uh, to the larger project and to describe its major claims and arguments. Renegade Rhymes, actually, I'm gonna, I will stop the slideshow now. I think that's, I'm going to stop my share and we'll come back to it. Renegade Rhymes is about the community represented by the artists and audience members at the 921.87 Rap Benefit Concert and about their engagements with rap music as a trenchant form of narrative discourse in Taiwan following the end of martial law. Building on and moving beyond debates about how global forms of hip hop proffer resistance to hegemonic ideologies or complicity with neoliberal ones, I position rap songs in Taiwan as synergetic efforts to imagine new forms of post authoritarian sociality. I argue that rappers' performance practices and pedagogical ambitions, their desires to teach with and through their musical activities, configure post authoritarianism as a kind of creative political intervention whose ultimate object is the reordering of epistemic hierarchies, power structures, and gender relations. The narrative ethos of rap, right, it's, it's kind of storytelling quality, is instrumental to its efficacy in this regard, shaping indelibly the processes by which rappers grapple with ontological questions about the nature of Taiwaneseness and coax revelatory musical effects from the idiosyncrasies of local languages. Drawing out the threads between their practices of masculine self-fashioning and claims to authority within the rap community, I reveal their art as a key site of knowledge production in a time of ongoing and profound transformation, a space in which to reflect, unmake, and remake their worlds. Of course, that, that, that rap music tells stories, right? And that these stories are especially meaningful to local audiences is not by itself a revelation. Almost anywhere in the world that rap sounds in its multifaceted guise as hip hop music, right? It profits from analysis as narrative. Although insistently technological and distinguished from earlier black musics in its mediation by sampling and sequencing, Rap's sonic and semantic strategies have antecedents, if not necessarily roots, in a, in a vast array of African and Afro-diasporic oral narrative traditions. These connections and others underscore the music's identity in the United States and elsewhere as a form for telling tales. As Imani Perry uh, de declares in her pathbreaking scholarship on hip hop's poetics and politics, 
The narrative, quote, the narrative in hip hop is a kind of storytelling, a late 20th century and early 21st century extension of traditional African-American folk tales, the MC replacing Dolomite or Br'er Rabbit, end quote. Storytelling is also ubiquitous in the discourse about rap, right, which has in the United States often been credited with surfacing the stories of the communities that originated it. Underscoring this point and extrapolating out geographically, Jay-Z writes in the concluding pages to his 2010 memoir, quote, that's my story. But the story of the larger culture is a story of a million MCs all over the world who are looking out their windows or standing on street corners or riding in their cars through their cities or suburbs or small towns. And inside of them, the words are coming too, the words they need to make sense of the world they see around them, end quote. Many of hip hop's most notorious narratives center the challenges of life in the streets, right? But the million MCs of Jay-Z's description exceed this subject matter to represent in their work an extraordinarily broad range of themes and affective registers. What connects their many and, and various rap stories, right? Whether they're about politics or parties or personal relationships is a professed commitment to keeping it real, right? Realness, this idea of realness is axiomatic of hip hop culture in its diverse global configurations. And its performance characteristics disclose locally specified conceptions of authenticity. Keeping it real, right, obligates artists to seek and convey truths, even through fiction, about and in conversation with the worlds that produce them. In order for their stories to pass muster, rappers wear their dedication to realness as a mantle, rejecting euphemism and calling out falsehoods and misrepresentations wherever they lie. The artists at the 921.87 Rap Benefit concert wore this mantle, I felt, very conspicuously. Um, and each subsequent performance deepened my awareness of this contract between performers and their public, right? Those for whom they performed and from whom they emerged, as well as of their epistemic, ethical, and political commitments, right? Their conceptions of the real. I was captivated not just by performers' aesthetic sensibilities and technical expertise, but by the ways they expressed hope that their stories about mudslides and 17th century civil uprisings would catalyze civic engagement in the present moment of upheaval. I also perceived what would become the crux of my readings of rap community discourse, rituals, and performances throughout the book. The rich interplay between craft and context, how the forms and aesthetic sensibilities of rap arm its practitioners with formidable hermeneutic tools. My analyses extend beyond their hermeneutic capabilities, also encompassing rappers' aspirations to conscious intervention. From their perspectives as young men on the island, deep sociocultural rifts, neoliberal economics, and distortions and lacunae of history in the educational system all represent sites of disorientation and logic, illogic, upon which they bring their talents to bear, not just as commentators, but also as agents of material change. They form clubs and creative collectives in which to nurture associational bonds and rehearse rituals of democratic citizenship. They tinker with compounds of words and musics that index the global and the local to limb out the contours of what we might call a Taiwanese rap sound. They hone identities as students and teachers in the hopes of acquiring the gravitas necessary to shape broader community norms and attitudes. They work not just to make sense of their world, but also to compel their world to make sense. I'm gonna share my screen again. Hopefully you can see the table of contents in the book now. So about the book, right? I organized the book along a fundamentally chronological arc, beginning and ending at moments of historical upheaval that compelled rappers to articulate their relationships to the past and their collective hopes for the future. In the chapters in between, I develop progressively the conceptual and aesthetic frameworks that structure these articulations. The first part, which is called Polyphonic Histories, comprises two chapters that approach the history of rap in Taiwan as itself a narrative construction, right? 
subject to revision and reinterpretation at the hands of multiple authors. Drawing on recordings, archival resources, and interviews with established and emerging artists. Um, and here's a couple of images of key figures in the book. Um, this part of the book, MC Hot Dog, if you know rap from Taiwan, um, this is a pivotal figure. Um, and two members of, of the Tri Poets, this is Ilmo and Shorty. I propose three distinct but overlapping histories, each unlocked by a different local gloss for the word rap. Right? The first, which is discussed in chapter one, considers rap in terms of its guise as shiha, a Mandarin transliteration of hip hop. Identifying rap as shiha affirms the island's status as a node in hip hop's cosmopolitan formation, a position enabled by the liberalization of Taiwan's media environment after the end of martial law and through democratization. Artists and fans who grapple with Taiwan's continued isolation from structures of international diplomacy take solace in the alternative structures of an incipient hip hop nationhood, forging trans-regional and translocal alliances with hip hop heads around the world. The second chapter examines two alternative glosses for rap. Wait, one is Raosha and the other is Niang Gua or in Mandarin Niang Ge. Um, that presume different historical centers of gravity. As Raosha, Mandarin for, I translate as rhapsodizing tongue, right? Rap is a musical technique that demands uh, verbal agility of its performers. The history of Raosha rambles through the landscape of Taiwan's prolific and polymorphous popular music industry. Artists identified uh, with the island's rock, pop, and folk scenes have since the mid-1980s employed rap-style vocalizations in their compositions, often without direct reference to hip-hop aesthetics, and more importantly, without claiming membership in any particular shiha community. Its lineage pulls from a broader musical culture characterized not only by its position in numerous circuits of media and migration, but also by a history of colonial encounter. Diverging yet further from global shiha, some rappers working predominantly in the Holo language claim lineage in Taiwan's sung narrative tradition, liam gua, literally song reading or songs with narration. Although different in their formal and functional particulars, rap and liam gua share similar features, including a storytelling ethos, a fundamentally improvisatory nature, and the use of speech song vocal techniques. Rappers capitalize on these commonalities, repositioning an ostensibly foreign art form as a logical extension or perhaps continuation of local cultural tradition. Taken together, the two chapters that make up part one do more than provide background. They also illustrate how desires to rethink historical narrative after the end of authoritarianism and to draw different through lines from past to present have crystallized in community discourse about the origins of rap itself. The second part of the book, Narratives and Knowledge, explores over the course of its three constituent chapters interventions that members of the rap community have made to reshape the conditions under which they live and learn. Chapter three, Masculinity Politics and Rap's Fraternal Order, examines how artists have invoked the masculine ethos of rap in their efforts to produce new forms of post-authoritarian social reality. Um, and this is a bit uh, an image from a, from a video shoot that I discuss pretty extensively in the chapter, illustrating sort of rap's predominantly male public. Um, I posit the scene's male dominance as an intuitive response to a series of sociocultural, political, and economic disjunctures that have unsettled gender roles in the island since the end of martial law. In the context of these changes, Rap artists like Dwagi, MC, MC Hot Dog, and, and Soft Lippa, whose works I examine sort of uh, closely, not sort of co closely in the chapter, have reimagined and refashioned uh, Confucian gender regimes and notions of intragroup hierarchy to create meaningful new spaces for male sociality, avenues for male self empowerment, and opportunities for the articulation of masculine identities not readily audible in the island's mainstream popular musics. Building on this discussion of gender and power, chapter four, which is called Performing Musical Knowledge Work, considers the myriad ways in which artists valorize and localize rap's discursive associations with knowledge, um, such that authority accrues to those who demonstrate the greatest prowess as teachers and scholars. Their pedagogical activities encompass songwriting, 
projects with university hip hop clubs and creative collectives, conferences, exhibitions, and contributions to a Taiwan specific digital platform called the Professional Technology Temple or PTT. Um, and here are two images from this chapter. One of, this is DJ Vicker demonstrating the basics of DJing to the National Taiwan University Hip Hop Culture Research Society. And one we have again, a second, oh, excuse me. Yes, uh, the Hip Hop Culture Research Society. Um, through these activities, I show community members acquire social capital, claim narrative agency, and carve out a meaningful existence within the constraints of neoliberal capitalism. Chapter five, We're So Strong, We're Writing History, examines a corpus of rap songs about Taiwan's past, contextualizing them within fractious debates about the contents of the national history curriculum that began in the immediate post-martial law period and have continued into the present. The centerpiece of the chapter is a kind of rap syllabus um, that advances a hip hop historiography of Taiwan and testifies to an ongoing desire among musicians and their social networks to consolidate collective memories of state violence, as well as to limb the connections between recent history and the more distant past. Um, and we revisit here the work of um, Kao Cho Ching and also of solo artist Zhang Rei Chen, as well as the group um, Chiho Brothers. Beyond asserting different perspectives on history, Artists also aspire to reshape social relations at and beyond the moment of performance. This intervention distributes the work of knowledge production into multiple hands and invites listeners to imagine together an array of possible futures, not just for the rap community, but for the world beyond. And finally, an epilogue listens for rap at the 2014 Sunflower Student Movement protests hearing symmetries between artists' affective responses following Sunflower and those following Typhoon Morakot, I contemplate rap as history of the present. I reflect briefly on the evolution of the scene in light of accelerating neoliberalization and continued challenges to Taiwan's de facto sovereignty. For the senior artists in the community, cir circumstances may change, but the imperatives of rap do not. There remain many lessons to teach and many stories to tell. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Meredith. That was uh, really a, a marvelous um, journey that on which you took us from the through the past uh, few years, um, and 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 leading us really, as you say, to the history of the present. Um, and um, you. I, I want to congratulate you really on the the, the beauty of the prose with which um, you do this in the book and um, which which you shared with us also this evening. Um, I I want to um, invite you and 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 Fred now into a sort of conversation um, that we will that we will. Uh, that in large part you will take over, but I'll I'll throw out some ideas that I hope you might you might you might follow as as well. Um, I'm quite um, as you know from our own conversations over uh, some time. I'm so interested in this question of narrative. Um, narrative has been a very important part of the the, the types of, of musical work that I do with 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 song as well, um, and um, and I was quite intrigued. Uh, in in the book, in the ways in which you you actually used rap as a means of negotiating these ideas of story storytelling, as you as you talk about it tonight, and and history, which is in some ways this trajectory that we find as we move even through the the the, the chapters of the book it's, itself. Um, and I'm interested in this relationship. I'm interested in this relation of narrative more broadly. Um, and, and perhaps it's at this point, too, or on this subject, too, that, that Fred might share some thoughts about the ways in which narrative, more broadly uh, considered in, in music, is so essential to, to, to Chinese music more broadly. Um, other genres of music, we think, of course, of, of various uh, genres of opera. Uh, in which narrative is very important. Narrative also then, again, combining these ideas of story 
and history. So um, I, 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 I turn the conversation over to the two of you, perhaps to to uh, pursue this topic a bit more. Great. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead, Fred. Go ahead, Meredith. Well, I was just going to say that I, I was, you know, um, initially drawn to this project um, because I was interested in, in narrative, right? I, I didn't come at this work, um, you know, with a kind of pre-fashioned identity as a, as a hip hop scholar, right? Um, but rather as someone who was really interested in, in forms, diverse forms of musical storytelling um, in the Taiwan context. And um, and questions about, you know, how those forms had been shaped by this, um, you know, political, um, um, the political shifts that accompanied um, the end of martial law, right? So I, I kind of went into to this project um, hoping to understand more about how people were telling stories musically. Um, and it was through this this first exposure, and it's why I wanted to share this bit from the prologue because it was such a formative moment for me um, in a in a in you know in a decade plus of research that was full of formative moments, um, you know, where I first uh, gained exposure to the community through this benefit concert, um, and and sort of just immediately. Um, began to understand this as sort of the storytelling genre par excellence <laughs> in, this, in this moment in, in popular music. Um, and then I found history kind of emerging as a persistent theme in interviews, right? As I started to really talk to people, um, people were really trying to understand better the relationship between official and unofficial histories and narrative, right? Um, and, and I will say also that this is something that mirrored um, my experience of the political discourse in the United States at the same time, right? What is historical truth, right? And we were asking, we're asking sort of a parallel set of questions. Um, you know, grand narratives, narratives of the state, right? And, and the smaller narratives that shape people's everyday lives, right? People were really thinking about this. And, and as I worked on the project, a kind of symmetry manifested in the structure of the book, right? Wherein, as as I put it, I'm really sorry, it's terrible, I'm going to quote myself, but um, at the end of the book where I say, we began by tracing three distinct but overlapping Taiwanese histories of rap, and we conclude by pondering three rap histories of Taiwan, right? And that was something that just emerged very organically in the research itself. It really is beautifully put, uh, Meredith. Uh, the, I have first said uh, to say that I truly enjoyed your prose, as Phil already mentioned. And um, I'd like to follow what Phil's been uh, just mentioned earlier about narrative. Uh, specifically, I want to bring in, you know, uh, as we know that in East Asian uh, narrative uh, through music, for example, we have this big genre in Chinese music called Shuo Chang. Uh, in particular, Xiangsheng. And then you have uh, examples from Korea, Panzori. Uh, you have examples from Japan, you know, Bunraku and uh, uh, Jururi. And also, you know, uh, even Southeast Asia, you have the uh, Tampon Suda. Uh, these are all genres. It's about always about history, uh, transmitting social values and morality then would it be too far-fetched to think or to link um, your study of Taiwanese uh, rap or shiha or however you want to put it uh, to traditional uh, shortang, uh, xiangsheng narratives in particular? If so, how much does the Taiwanese case take on this social or civil revolt sentiment and yet making this uh, truly uh, a locale-specific genre? I mean, it's a, it's a tricky question, right? And and um, my my first unsatisfying but fundamentally, I think, <laughs> true answer <laughs> is that it depends who you ask, right? Um, there are some people uh, who you know have been performing as rap artists for a long time who will say, like, yeah, absolutely, these are historical threads that are important to how I think about this work. And then you'll talk to artists, you know, who will kind of reject that position and say, absolutely not. My primary influences fall far outside the realm of, um, you know, regional, um, you know, narrative, historical, historically important musical narrative traditions. Um, 
but that said, um, I think, you know, for me as an ethnomusicologist, of course, of course, those connections are fast, like fascinating to plumb, right? Um, and, and also, fa it's fascinating to note, um, you know, I often get the question, well, how is Taiwanese rap unlike other forms of rap music? And, and there are many ways in which it is unlike other forms of rap music in the world, right? It has distinct local characteristics. But there are many ways in which like that's not really the point, um, actually, that it connects meaningfully to other forms of rap from around the world, that those points of connection are just as important as those points of divergence. And so, you know, an important point of connection, I think, is that this desire to transmit um, knowledge or information or feeling about the past um, through rap as a narrative form is also something that comes down to rap artists in Taiwan from American hip hop, right? Um, that this is also a, a persistent um, sort of theme in American hip hop. So, you know, I I think it's, um, it depends who you ask, but for me as someone who is always thinking, listening, listening for these things, right? Um, I, I absolutely can always hear artists in, in, in really different, diverse, creative ways um, you know, thinking about and, and making new and fascinating things from those connections. That's wonderful. That's exactly, you know, I was thinking that you are giving uh, 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 credence to the creativity, just put it in something that remotely sounds and looks so familiar, and yet it's not as specific. I think that tension is what makes the Taiwanese rap such a a wonderful genre and your take on it is, is really great. Thank you. And just to say one more thing about this, um, you know, in terms of, of um, efforts to kind of distance um, rap music from traditional narrative forms, right? That is something that you that you do find, um, particularly in regards to um, to the, the narrative form Shu Lai Bao, right? Right. Um, that that actually you know artists will say um with great with great frequency um that they aspire to not sound like they are doing shulai ball when they're doing rap right because it it has such a kind of stiff and um measured sound to it right that has this emphasis on end rhyme and you know we want to hear more complex internal rhyme schemes if possible um so there's that too right there's understanding aesthetic preferences in terms of um, you know, negation, right? <laughs> what do I not want to be doing? I don't want to be sound. I don't want to sound like I'm doing Shangsheng. I don't really want to sound like I'm doing Shu Lai Bao. Um, but I understand that there is a relationship there. I'm, I'm fascinated by your, your conversation here because uh, um, studies of narrative very often move in the in the direction of thinking about the ways in which certain kinds of narrative styles and music become regional become important locally and regionally and historically um in in specific ways uh, one thinks of epics in the in the mediterranean as a, as a, as an example of this epic music that is um and 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 what you're talking about now is something really almost emergent from a past but in the present um in 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 Taiwan um and in east and potentially in, in Chinese and East Asian musics more, more more generally uh with rap playing this really critical role um I'd like to ask you both if you might say a little bit about the ways in which language is crucial to to the to the ways in which rap is 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 funk is has come to establish itself as such a a recognizable recognizable and recognizably powerful uh, genre in 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 East Asian music and Chinese music, um, specifically this the, the relation between the, the dialect, different regional languages different historical languages, languages that um, that are shared between different regions as well, but used in different registers within song. Uh, Meredith, you showed how you, you spoke to the to the to, to the, your need to hear the different the, the differences between the movements between um, indigenous languages, um, Mandarin as as a as a as a as a 
as a, as a shared language, um, as a literary language. Um, and, and I wonder if, if, if two of you might say a little bit about this. We, we, um, Adam Kielman, um, a few months ago when he was talking about the popular music in, in Southern China also made the point that this is, this is what's modern about, uh, uh popular music in Southern China. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, language is just a huge, um, huge and fascinating and rich topic, <laughs> both, both for the <laughs> artists themselves and for anyone um, looking at and thinking kind of critically about, uh, about the rap scene. And, and so, you know, for me, um, you know, so rap in Taiwan is multilingual, right? Um, some artists, uh, of course, you know, uh, Mandarin is uh, the language at this point that is is the sort of the lingua franca, right, of the island. And so there's a lot of Mandarin language rap. Um, but there are artists who work in local languages like Holo Hakka and increasingly in, in indigenous languages. Um, and, um, you know, for me, one of the most fascinating things um, as I as I came to, you know, know and love this repertoire, um, was was to listen to the ways in which the different languages used sort of shaped the aesthetics of the performance, right? What kinds of languages sounded which way, right? Um, how how did the 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 vocalizer approach using particular languages in their performance? Um, and um, and it was fascinating to listen to artists talk about what language meant to them, right? So not all artists approach each language with the same degree of fluency. Um, and I found this uh, as I went to translate certain certain song texts, right? There were some artists who were using, for example, Holo, um, more or less following the same grammar as Mandarin, but with certain kinds of very consistent word substitutions and, and um, with Holo pronunciations. Uh, and, and that was work that was really relatively straightforward for me to translate as someone who studied Mandarin. Um, you know, uh, and, and this is unquestionably kind of generational, right? People who, who tended to write in that way um, were around the same age as me, right? <laughs> and had grown up, um, you know, had, had had the earliest stages of their education in, in, in the last years of martial law and had grown up in a predominantly Mandarin, in a Mandarin dominant environment, right? Um, these also tended to be artists who were using rap to learn to learn their mother language, their mother tongues, right? And they didn't really learn them in school. They internalized a lot of language-based shaming. That's something that, that I talk about in the book. Um, but through rap, they realized that they could um, build a new kind of um, relationship with local languages and a new kind of understanding of their identity as Taiwanese, right? Um, and this includes speakers of, as I've said, indigenous languages, right, Austronesian languages, which have been multiply marginalized and stigmatized and suppressed throughout different colonial regimes in Taiwan. So indigenous language rap um, is, is beginning to flourish, but it's taken nearly two decades <laughs> of having <laughs> um, available indigenous language media and, and strengthening indigenous uh, political activism to make that possible. So, so language is, um, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's really, it's critical to thinking about both the aesthetics and, um, and these, these larger sort of social, cultural, political, emotional meanings. Mm. I think you, you're absolutely right on, in particular uh, for, uh, for Taiwan, the use of language in marking um, a place in, in society or within the nation. Uh, of course, the same kind of language and diversity uh, issue is emerged uh, probably throughout um, uh, the entire East Asia. Uh, you know, people from Kansai being laughed at from people from uh, Tokyo, for example, and people not speaking uh, the Korean, uh, the Seoul-based Korean and being laughed at. So. Uh, as people who've been to Taiwan know that, you know, the so-called three recognized uh, public language, uh, the Guoyu, uh, the Taiwanhua, and then the Kejiahua. Now, the three, uh, Hotlo didn't even make that. And not to mention <laughs> indigenous language is nowhere to be 
heard within the, uh, the public transportation system. So that's already an indication of the pecking order. So when rapper raps uh, in different kind of language, of course, it's a demonstration of their um, acknowledgement of their identity and also their uh, exerting their power. Just like, you know, uh, whether consciously or subconsciously, this is an expression of it. And how much do you think of the use of these kinds of languages, you know, uh, is giving the uh, rappers or people a sense of like, yeah, we want to be that. And, or, yeah, we want to be a, a place within, you know, this nation state, for example, and we have a place in it and I want to push that in. Uh, do you see um, rappers doing that kind of stuff or the audience uh, owning music in that way? Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. I think that was um, a lot of what compelled um, you know, the earliest rap artists to record in local languages to do that, right? That they, they were really eager to uh, exercise their agency um, and to um, kind of stake a claim about about their their identities. Um, so I think, yeah, absolutely. Um, and yeah, I, I'm trying to think about how to articulate this. It's not a fully formed thought, but it just ties back in such interesting ways to me to this to these processes of learning, right? Um, that you know um, you can sort of see in certain artists um, the corpus of their works, a kind of evolution. Of, of their own comfort or fluency with a particular language as well, right? So, um, you know, I think I think that that for a lot of artists is motivated at the earliest stages by by a desire to kind of um, um, locate themselves in in the political in the political mm -hmm. sense of things, right? Or, or yeah. claim claim a space, a political. Yeah, space. I, I'm always kind of get drawn by the tension between well a rap artist what do they want they want uh lots of sale for their music and things like that you know so sort of the e economic side of rap music but then i'm always constantly being pulled back to the sort of political statement side and the social civil revolt side of rap music so this kind of tension uh obviously is very difficult to discern and also uh, uh clarify so I think, yeah, yeah. and and no, thank you for mentioning that. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, no, no, no. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, and I I'll, I'll, I want to actually make clear that you know I I've talked about these um, very sort of um, overtly political performances in this talk today, but. I talk about a lot of different kinds of music in the book itself, right? Um, not all of which is explicit in its politicking um some of it is rap can be about anything right um and artists really do want to make rap about anything and everything um but um yeah this te the tension that you describe right and this desire to sort of think about how can i speak my truth but also make a living right is is also something that is explored um, in depth in this this chapter, I think it's chapter four, performing four. musical knowledge work, right? Where um, we think about how how artists make the decision at times to, you know, engage in activities that they know aren't going to be lucrative in any you know grand sense, right? But they but right. they do it out of a love for this um, for this form and out of a desire to. Um, you know, acquire gravitas, right? Or to show their gravitas, right? Um, to others. So yeah, thank you for, for, for that. Thanks. This is such a wonderful conversation. And, and, and I think it's time um, also to invite um, some of those viewing the, 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 the program to the webinar today and to, to pose some questions and, um, and, and ask you to respond to them. Um, so I'll kind of, I'll make that transition. Uh, we, we have a couple 
questions already that that have, have been sent in and um i'm i'm going to I'll, I'll i'll read them more or less as they've been sent in rather than trying to to summarize them um and let me begin with a a, a question well i think it's very much uh directed toward us as ethnomusicologists uh, working in these areas. And, and, and the question is the following, what does a specifically ethnographic approach offer to the study of rap music and popular music more broadly? Can you please share some reflections on the process and experience of carrying out the ethnographic research that is the foundation of this book? I love that question. Uh, <laughs> I, want, I want to talk about it for a whole other hour. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, you know, I think that when you um, when you try to learn something about rap only from the media that rappers produce, right, from from recordings or from um, you know, public appearances, television shows, that kind of thing. Um, it can, it, it gives you a really sort of impoverished sense of what compels people to, to, to make this music. Right. And, and, and there is something really, I think, um, I would argue to an extent that is greater than, than in a lot of, um, forms of popular music. There is a kind of, you know, I talk about this, the importance of this idea of realness, right. Of, of, being, being real in your music, but there is also a kind of, um, of, I don't know, uh, a character sort of that a lot of rap artists play on stage, right? That, um, that is compelling, but that sort of conceals a little bit of who they are as individuals, right? Um, you know, it's, it's the performance is about sort of connecting them to this wider world of of rap and 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 of hip hop culture um but but as individuals you know they're really distinct from from one another um and and may actually um uh as i found you know um be um just sort of deeply deeply nerdy about this right just want to do just want to research and learn and 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 dig into the music and its history in some cases um and so i think that you know doing ethnography really talking to people and um you know all of the things that ethnography entails participant observation um you know documentation over a long period of time um attending not one or two but but dozens and dozens of concerts gives you a sense of, of kind of the arc of, of artist development, but, but also helps you to understand their motivations in ways that you really just can't if all you're looking at is the final product, right? You're not seeing the process. You're not seeing the, um, all of the minute decisions that are being made uh, and the conflicts that are being felt and the passions that are being pursued when you're just looking at the recorded artifact at the end. Um, so that's sort of how I, how I feel about it. Fred, I don't know if you have thoughts on this. No, I think you, <laughs> you have attended more rap concert than I do. So I have uh, not much of, uh, in terms of fewer reflection uh, because, you know, I think your opening prologue is so moving. You know, when I read it, I said, wow, you know, the way you captured the sentiment and, and, and the way you you uh, present your informants and the context was just so marvelous. So I, I urge uh, people who want to really think about how to do field work in there, uh, look at the prologue of your book. It really is, it just sucks you into uh, uh, the context you're talking about. Thank you. I, I wonder, even as an extension of, of this discussion about fieldwork and ethnography, uh, if, if both of you could comment a, a bit about the um, what your students are doing, and are they are they feeling the impulse to do ethnography, which was which was so important even for our decisions to become ethnomusicologists, for example. Hmm. Do you want to answer first? Okay, I'll answer first. Um, I think the, the, the question uh, is really relevant to, to quite a few of, of our students currently doing similar work uh, in various parts of China. Uh, 
uh, absolutely someone's looking at um, the rap music in, in, in Nanjing, for example, one student. The other one is looking at sort of, sort of the new genre, uh, minority, and also into this soft music kind of stuff. So they are actually grappling with this, this issue of how to, you know, uh, ethnography. How do I do it? What is considered to be sufficient? And what should I ask? How should I you know, these kind of nuts and bolts and nitty gritty part of ethnography. I think if you could kind of share some of those nitty gritty stuff, that would be of help to quite a few of them who I, I believe they are here. Oh, me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, yeah. I mean, I do, do you mind? I'd love, to, can I first answer Phil's question about what my students are doing? Sure, um, absolutely. Because I, because I teach at I teach at Emory, which is an all undergraduate um, program, the music department, and so um, you know, I, I it's been my privilege actually these last two years to teach an undergraduate seminar, an advanced writing seminar, on musical ethnography, and um, this year uh, I have a stellar, a small but stellar group, um, and I'm working with a program that we have at Emory. Um, called the Arts and Social Justice Fellowship Program that pairs faculty with a local artist from Atlanta um, who's interested or pursuing social social justice through their work. And so our work as, as a collective has been to develop locally based um, projects where we're thinking about the relationship specifically between the activities of teaching artists in Atlanta and, um, and and the aims of social justice activism. And so my students um, in a lot of cases don't know what ethnography is until they come into a class like this for the first time. Um, and are really, um, I, I hope, I think, um, you know, excited to learn that um, maybe works that they've been exposed to in other classes that are based on ethnographic, you know, res research that draw on qualitative data, right? Um, but this is how it's done, right? And so they're learning kind of the nuts and bolts of interviewing and um, even transcribing the complexities of transcribing interviews um, of, of they're really thinking hard about ethics. Um, what does it mean to decide to do a project or when, when are you not the right person to do that project? Um, how does this connect to the history of, of, you know, anthropology as a kind of colonial enterprise? How do you think about positionality and power? Um, so, so those are all things that I'm working on with my undergrads and finding challenging, but, but incredible, like so much, so gratifying, so much fun. Um, so, you know, in terms of, of your students, you know, thinking, um, I think your question was, what was your question? What, <laughs> you cover most of the, the, the answers, <laughs> but actually, you know, I, precisely that, you know, how do you, to do when you, when you conduct uh, ethnographic work within, you know, in popular music or in the rap situation, you know, once you get there, how do you grapple with those questions? positionality, uh, are you being uh, sort of orientalists? Are you being colonialist in your perspective? And when you ask questions, when you get the data, uh, how do you treat them? Uh, yeah. that, those are all interrelated questions that you've already uh, touched upon. That's really fantastic. Yeah. I, I guess I would just say by way of conclusion that those questions never stop. They should never stop. Right. They should be part of the beginning of a project, the middle of a project. And we all know when we do ethnography that it never ends. Right. Um, so, you know, these are questions that I'm constantly asking myself as as I'm I'm working through um, even thinking about, you know, where I might want to take these questions next. Um, so so they should never stop. There should never be an end point to to those questions. Mm. And you have Teresa Tank. Uh behind you so you can yeah. apply all that yes whole 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 other ball of, of yarn well just as we 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 know that um ethnography ne never ends um and that we're really engaged in the history of the present um i also am aware that um, that this webinar not unfortunately i would say very fortunately because we've had such a rich presentation and such a wonderful conversation um it 
th this webinar needs to come to an end um, as it's scheduled to do. And I, I return now to, to, to Mark as, as he, as he bring, as he offers some concluding remarks. And, and I want to thank Meredith and Fred for, for joining us today. Um, this has been really, really exciting. Um, and I, I can't think of a better way to end when we talk about the future that our students will be, be bringing to us. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And, thank and, you, and thank, Phil. Thank you all for being here and, and um, chatting with me. Thank you, Phil and Meredith. I enjoyed it. Um, I just want to second Phil's uh, uh, thanks to Meredith and Fred and, and for bringing all your knowledge and your valuable insights on this topic. I'm sure everybody that joined the program tonight learned a whole lot more than they than knew coming into the program about rap music in Taiwan. Um, I just wanted to give you a little uh, sense of what's going on um, on November 17th. Uh, we have another program uh, on sports, uh, the series episode two on sports with Professor Alan Sanderson, who's of the University of Chicago, Kenneth C. Griffin Department of Economics. Uh, he'll return and he'll be joined by other panelists to discuss the importance of global sporting events and the economic impact on host cities and a new model of what we're calling dynamic sustainability for the Olympics of the future. So I hope you can all tune in. That is a morning program on November 17th. We've got a time change in the States. So uh, we'll probably start to have a couple morning programs here. It's 9.30 a.m. Hong Kong time. So make sure you follow our social media accounts for the UN Campus website. And as always, I wanna remind you to listen to uh, the course podcast on Apple Podcast or wherever you find your podcast. There you can hear Professor Bowman and many of other um, our other U Chicago faculty talk about how they became professors. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Have a great evening or day wherever you may be.